Hello, I'm Maeve Collins and I'm Ireland's Deputy Permanent Representative to the European Union. I'm based in Brussels and my job involves preparing the work of the EU Council of Ministers as they make laws on social, economic and environmental issues. I'm delighted to welcome you all today to our virtual St. Bridget's Day event at the Irish Perm Rep. On St. Bridget's Day, the Department of Foreign Affairs celebrates the creativity and achievements of Irish women all around the world. To mark St. Bridget's Day in Brussels, the seat of many of the EU institutions, we will hear today from three Irish women who work in and for the EU. This event is aimed at those who are interested in the EU and also at those who are interested in a job in the EU institutions or just knowing more about the kind of jobs on offer. Our speakers will introduce themselves and give us some reflections and insights on their own career journeys. Once their presentations start, you'll get a chance to ask them your own questions through the Slido platform by going to the web page sli.do and using the code SBD2021 to access the system. You don't have to sign up, anyone can do it. This information will appear again in the video description. After the Q&A, my colleague Eamon McA will be on hand to answer questions specific to the EU jobs application process. And any question we can't get to today, we'll take up with you by email afterwards. At the end of the event, Eamon will say a few words and he launched the first in a series of five videos made by Irish women working in different roles in the EU institutions. We invite you to follow our Twitter and YouTube accounts where each of these videos will be launched successively every morning over the next four days. Anyway, we're absolutely delighted to have with us today three Irish women, each doing a fascinating job while representing Ireland in Europe. Mairead McGuinness is Ireland's European Commissioner and she has responsibility for financial services, financial stability and the Capital Markets Union. Commissioner, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. Karen Banks is the Deputy Director General of the European Commission's Legal Service. Apart from her own stellar career, Karen has given support to many Irish women through her leadership of the Irish Women's Network in Brussels. Joining us from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia is Ellen Flanagan, a junior professional in the EU delegation to Malaysia. Ellen is also a former graduate policy officer with us at the Irish Perm Rep, and like myself, she is a graduate of UCC. So it's a great pleasure to welcome all three of you today to share your stories. Let's get started. I'm going to hand over to our special guest, European Commissioner Mairead McGuinness, for some insights. Commissioner, can you tell us how did it all start for you? How, how, how did Europe come into your life? Well, good afternoon, everyone, or wherever you are, uh, maybe good morning is more appropriate. And just to, to thank you, Maeve, uh, for your leadership on this issue and to say a very happy St. Bridget's Day to all of us. Um, and I'm really impressed to join Ellen and Karen and yourself this morning. Um, when I look back, I was 14 when Ireland joined the EEC. So in a sense, I have that history of before and, and since. Um, and that's been a long journey. Um, when I was a journalist, uh, after I left college, I would have dealt with European stories all the time because they were central to a lot of the work that I was doing. And clearly then when I entered politics, you see it fr from another perspective. Um, what I think this morning is about is to, I suppose, show people the opportunities uh, that are out there in terms of their own personal development, but equally for Ireland as a country, how important it is that we have uh, people who are interested in working in the institutions at whatever level and with whatever experience and skills they have. And maybe also from my side, because I have worked a lot with young Irish people and Irish or people of all nationalities, um, I've been hugely impressed by the standards and the ability that young Irish people and young people generally across Europe bring to the institutions, whether it's languages or technology or just their ability to deal with such complex issues. So, for example, on, when I got elected in 2004, obviously people approach you to see can they get work and we would go through a process. And I have never been let down. I have always been hugely impressed by those who've stayed one month or three months or five years or whatever. And what's really, uh, I think, important is to understand, you use the word uh, network, 
how it really it is so crucial for the young people to have that uh, network. It's more difficult today because you're doing things remotely. And maybe that's something that in the Q&A that you could address, because I would worry about young people being on their own in apartments or not having that social connection. But to go back to my own experience, in a way, what you need if, to work in institutions, obviously, there's the basic requirements uh, that are asked of, of when you're entering. But above and beyond that, it's about flexibility. It's about creativity. Um, it's about opportunity. And sometimes the freshest and youngest minds come to issues with a very different perspective. And that's what we need, because if you still only have a one sided perspective, you don't get a better decision making process. Also, the ability to adapt, you know, to change if there an issue arises or to be able to um, contact somebody. In one sense, it's also basic communication skills about reaching out. Um, more and more, we send emails or messages through various social media. Um, I think the value of a full stop or a capital letter, these, to my mind, are still important. Maybe that's gone a bit too fluid. But I think when we are communicating as professionals, we should have those basic standards. And again, in my experience, I have found uh, our young people to be really able to adjust to that. Let me also say that it's not easy all the time. And maybe this is true of every um, career, at least in its beginnings. But many, I'm sure many of you would share stories as well, as would Karen. Ellen, you probably have stories, but, but lucky you're younger than the rest of us. But I think it's important to say that when you move particularly country, I'm sure that's quite lonely sometimes. It's, it's very exciting, but it comes with that, you know, bit of loneliness, how you deal with that. Do you have enough people around you that can give you that support? Or maybe are you willing to say to whoever you're working with, look, I don't feel particularly good at the moment and have a, a conversation. I would have had a few of those conversations with people I worked with in the past. And once you say it then, and we all know, we can work together to fix that dilemma. So never be afraid to reach out. Uh, it's hugely important that you do that. If you're not comfortable going to your immediate boss, if you like, talk to somebody who might help you to do it. I'm a great believer that your foundation, your first steps in a career really mark everything. And if they go well, then I think everything can, can go well. Equally, things sometimes don't go well and how you deal with that, how you don't let it knock you off course completely. I think that's also important. And maybe what's important as well, and again, I'd love to hear what Ellen is saying and Karen and indeed may have your own experience is maybe not to have a fixed view of how the world will be as you enter the work. You know, one of the really, um, I suppose, sad realities is that because of COVID, many, many very able young people across Europe will be denied an opportunity to start a career because in many industries, unfortunately, public health measures require that everything is closed down. I'm thinking of travel, I'm thinking of tourism, many other sectors as well. So, you know, be mindful that sometimes you get a difficult start. Uh, when I was starting out in the early 80s, things weren't great economically. And okay, I got a contract uh, in, in RTE, but then I had to, it was, it ended and then I had to fight for a contract. And I always tell that story so that people don't think that everything is easy at the end. It's, it's always going to be tough. And I think, our, you know, the measure of us all is how we react in that moment and how we keep our, if you like, keep our, our calm. Um, but I, I, you know, because I have a young family myself, teenage, adults rather than teenagers, I'm very sensitive to how their lives are impacted by their first job, by their first refusal, by COVID and all of these things. So, you know, I take my hat off to young people at the moment. I think to some extent when I was starting out, there were easier opportunities, frankly. So to those of you who want to reach out, there are members of the European Parliament, there is the Commission, there are many, many other institutions, there's Department of Foreign Affairs, there are loads of opportunities. You have better language skills, I imagine, that, than I had. Um, and I'm just so impressed by every single um, young Irish person that has come through my office. And I've been very proud to see them move on. And, and I suppose that's wonderful too, to see them making progress in their own right, in their own chosen field. Thank you very much for that, um, Commissioner. And I wonder, could you just say a few words for people to give us a sense of what your typical working day is like? You probably don't have a typical working day, but if you want to give 
examples of the, the, the kind of things that, that you would do day to day in Brussels. I think a lot, particularly of our younger listeners, would be would be very interested to hear about that. Well, well thanks. And maybe maybe I'll talk about the two institutions that I have knowledge of. So the European Parliament, um, there aren't any typical working days for members of the European Parliament. And indeed, that was how I operated up until uh, my, I moved here in October. Um, what you're dealing with is issues. So you have committee structures, there are agendas for committees. Uh, and you deal with those technical issues within committee, you deal within a political group, and then you deal in the wider parliament. So really it's about that um, structure of committees, you then have group structures, and then you have plenary sittings. And all along the process is about moving items, whether it's on a food safety issue, for example, uh, moving um, you know, reports, uh, tabling amendments and then negotiating where you're deeply involved as a rapporteur on the actual fine tuning. And very often the young people that work in my office and indeed anyone who works in a, a member's office would deal with the amendments and, you know, checking all of these things, but really work hard with other assistance to MEP. So there's that network as well as the political network. Um, and then, of course, when it comes to votes, you know, looking at voting lists, which are not an easy thing to do. But again, it's very impressive how people take on with that role. If I move to the Commission, in a way, the, the work here is more detailed on specific policy issues. So, for example, on financial stability, those issues that I look after, um, there's one issue, for example, like an anti-money laundering uh, proposal, which will be coming up because we know that there is a lot of dirty money in the system globally and we want to address that as an issue. I mean, I mentioned COVID and the reality and, and the impact it's having on our economies and on different sectors of society. So we are watching carefully to make sure that banks are lending because we need to have money in the system to allow businesses to survive, but also conscious where there may be difficulties for some sectors. And I suppose that's a, an issue I think which will be on our minds for this coming year, because we know that this is a crisis we have never dealt with before. It's not like any previous one. We cannot blame anybody um, except a virus that we weren't prepared for. And maybe that's something that we need to check ourselves with, that that big issue of a global pandemic. While people talked about it, I think the structures and networks weren't put in place to deal with it. They are now and we are we are beginning to deal effectively. But I think we will learn hard lessons. So specifically around that issue in my area here, I just have to be mindful around economic issues, banking issues, uh, business issues, making sure that those who are vulnerable because they cannot repay loans don't fall victim to a system that would be cruel to the reality of their lives because lots of people had excellent business plans going into uh, this crisis and their businesses were thriving and then suddenly their businesses were shut. So, I mean, one of the interesting things about all of this is that some sectors um, are thriving. So food and, and supermarkets and all of that and cooking and all those things. Uh, restaurants, of course, aren't. And, and here in Brussels, they've been closed for such a long period of time that it will take a long time before we see that recover. So it is about um, ongoing policy work and then other things that arise uh, in terms of uh, what we do on a day to day basis. And I suppose that's why all of us rely on our assistance. Um, and that's why we want able young people to come from our universities, our colleges uh, with whatever skills they have and to feed into that network. Um, and I think as a country, uh, we know we need to make pro more progress. There were many more Irish people in the system some time back. We've allowed things slip a little. And I think we have to reach out to the colleges uh, to encourage, which they are, young people to think about the institutions. But, you know, I have a college student at home trying to study and do lectures at home. And again, for students, that's really difficult. And I'm thinking of leaving certs as well, who have all of this uncertainty. Um, so it's a brittle time in terms of policy and decision making and, and careers. And maybe go back to the point that I made, whatever you start, I suppose, don't have a, an expectation that the road will be smooth or without a twist. Um, but I think try and be true to yourself. And I have to say again, going back to the many uh, young people who've worked with me, um, you know, they've all been fantastic, fantastic. And whatever issues arose of, as I said, maybe loneliness on occasion or being homesick, which that happens, uh, we've dealt with them once we acknowledge them. So um, there are real opportunities here. And I would wish anyone uh, really to look in this direction and every success uh, if that is your chosen path. 
Thanks, Commissioner. And I think that's a that's a powerful testament to the kind of public service that can be rendered as well um, through a job in the EU institutions. So I'm going to turn now with your permission to the next speaker, Karen Banks, who works as the, the, the deputy head of the Commission Legal Service. Karen, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Can you tell us about your career path, how you came to do the job you're in? What were the landmarks for you along the way? Well, I'm a bit um, untypical because I was not one of these people who always knew that you wanted to work for an EU institution. Uh, I got here in quite an accidental manner. In fact, I was working as a young solicitor uh, in a country town in Ireland and getting a bit bored. And in fact, what I wanted to do was to go back to university and do a master's degree, but I wasn't sure I was going to be able to raise the money to do that. And while I was looking around and trying to figure out how I would get someone to go guarantor for me and so on, I thought about other possibilities. And amongst other things, I wrote to the commission office in Dublin and sort of said, here's my CV. Do you have anything I might be uh, acceptable for? And I got back a very discouraging letter uh, saying uh, you will be informed of any competitions for which you are eligible. I had never heard of competitions. I had no idea how the system worked. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I ended up uh, organising the bank loan and going off to London to do my uh, master's degree. And while I was there, the office in Dublin, true to its word, uh, sent me an official journal and said, here's the thing you seem to be eligible for. Why don't you fill out the forms and so on? And so the process of uh, sitting the concours happened very gently for me because I was focused on my master's uh, course and on the wonderful year I was having at the LSE uh, uh, way, way back in the 70s. Um, uh, sorry, that's not right. No, the 80s. Uh, and the, the doing of the competition, therefore, wasn't as nerve wracking for me as it was for other people, because my whole life wasn't hanging on it, so to speak. Anyway, at the end of the year, uh, back in Dublin, uh, back in another uh, small solicitor's uh, office, uh, owing a lot of money to the bank, uh, facing into very grim times. We were now in 1982. Um, and the next thing I get a phone call uh, from the commission saying, would you like to come for an interview? And it sort of just sort of went on like that. So I was very lucky. I kind of tumbled into uh, a job uh, in the legal service because there was someone from the legal service on the panel that interviewed me. And uh, he liked the look of me. And that was it. I, I got recruited. So I arrived very raw, not really having much clue how the place worked. Uh, never having done specialised studies in EU law, and I just learnt it on the job. That that was how how it was. So then, as far as uh, the markers in career are concerned, um, I started out. They put me into the competition team in the legal service, which was quite extraordinary because I also had no background in economics whatsoever. So I was having to learn EU law and a very economic uh, dimension of EU law at the same time. On the other hand, it was lucky because my French when I arrived was just schoolgirl French, you know, not at all fluent enough to defend myself in meetings. And the lucky thing about working in the competition area was that that was even then done very largely in English. Um, and that gave me four years to sort of get into the swing of things and look around me and find out about broader aspects of EU law. The next team I was moved to was the social affairs team. And that was absolutely brilliant, perhaps the best, most interesting part of my career. Not all of it, of course, because when you start in a team in the legal service, they tend to send you to Siberia. They give you the least interesting, the most technical things to do because they know they'll never get you to do them later. So it was only slowly and by a constant process of lobbying that I finally ended up in my last two years in that team with what I just loved, which was equal opportunities and labour law. And that was great. And then I went through, I don't want to enumerate all the different teams that I have been in. I did intellectual property at one point, uh, and my last team before becoming director was the agriculture and fisheries team. In there somewhere, I spent a few years uh, in a cabinet with uh, Porik Flynn. He was commissioner for social affairs at the time, and I was the equal opportunities uh, person in, in his team. 
Then in 2011, I became director, so head of the Agri Fish team in the legal service, which means that you're giving legal advice to, uh, it was the department that takes care of agriculture, the one that takes care of fisheries, and also part of uh, DG Santé, the part that deals with animal and plant uh, health and so on. And then my current role came about quite by accident. Um, I had never had an ambition beyond becoming director. I wanted that. I knew up to the level of director, I was aiming for that. I wanted to become a head of a team in the legal service. And I had no thought of going beyond. But the then deputy director general left early for his own uh, personal reasons. He suddenly decided to go and the position was free. And my then director general suggested to me that I should put my hat in the ring. And that's how it happened. Thank you very much for that, uh, Karen. And I think a theme um, that we'll, we'll hear more about today is that um, there isn't a planned route that goes in a straight line to no. uh, a career destination. There are always happy accidents or, or, or difficult situations um, that will drive us in one direction or another and that will present opportunities um, or sometimes opportunities to rethink a career choice as well. Mm. Can, can I just ask you, why would you say it's important for Ireland to be represented in, um, in the services that you have worked in? Okay, well, of course, it's very important. And you see that when you're actually doing the daily work. Um, it's not a question of representing your country, because, of course, officially we don't do that. Uh, we work for the common good. Um, but in terms of getting Irish interests understood, in terms of making sure that a dimension to a discussion, which would be uh, of particular importance to Ireland or that would be seen in a particular way in an Irish context, gets across, it's incredibly important to have a good spread of Irish people everywhere. I'll give you an example. Years and years ago, when I was in the social affairs team, young lawyer, uh, I became aware that there was an infringement procedure going against Ireland because of the obligation uh, to have Irish if you wanted to be a teacher in, in the Irish system. And that was considered, there was a complaint from a Dutch lady uh, who found it disproportionate and, you know, why should she have to pass an Irish exam to teach uh, in, in an Irish, uh, in fact, it was the tech, I think, uh, uh, not even a, a secondary school. Um, and I was really quite shocked and realised that this was just not being dealt with with anything like the necessary sensitivity in terms of uh, cultural diversity and the importance of a language which is under, under uh, strain. And I managed uh, by arguing and by making sure that the Irish cabinet of the time got involved uh, to change the uh, conversation completely and to get that infringement procedure closed. And then when a preliminary ruling case came, so an Irish court sent a question to the Court of Justice asking whether the rules on free movement under EU law uh, forbade this uh, language requirement, I was then the agent in that case, and we managed to get a very interesting and satisfying judgment from the court. So it's just to say you need people in all the different interstices of the commission to simply become aware that something is being done, which is of great concern to Ireland and that perhaps needs greater sensitivity in its treatment. Thanks, Karen. And I would say every member state across the, uh, the the union would echo what you've said. We do need people who understand both the cultural, political and historical context in those mm. roles um, exactly. across the US from all of the countries to, to ensure that diversity really is upheld and, uh, yes. and preserved. So thank you very much for that. Can I turn now to, um, to Ellen, who, um, I know was working here with us in the Perm Rep only a short time ago, but who now is coming to us from uh, Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. So, Ellen, would you like to tell us a bit about yourself, how you got that job uh, and, you know, what your what your every day is like? Sure, Ambassador, thank you. And uh, law, fellow breeder, Diyush Galer. 
Um, thank you for having me here today and thank you to the Commissioner and also to Karen for your really interesting remarks so far. I'm scribbling notes here and learning things myself, so it's uh, also a benefit for me to be part of this panel. Um, I work for the EU delegation to Malaysia at the moment. I'm a junior professional, as you said, and I'm on a two-year posting here um, representing both Ireland and the EU. I was chosen by Ireland, but I, I work for the external action <clears throat> action service excuse me we have about 140 delegations around the world so it's an extremely interesting job it's something that attracted me straight off the bat when i understood that the eu has its own diplomatic service that um it's such there's such a wide variety of um, areas you can cover and things that are of different interest to, and geog geographical areas so i originally originally did a law and french degree in ucc and that kind of showed me immediately that I was interested in the European Union. Um, I did my Erasmus year in Strasbourg and I can't stress the importance of doing an Erasmus year if you can at all, it's an amazing experience. And during that year, I got to intern in the um, European Parliament as well with an Irish MEP. And I know the commissioner was mentioning that these are brilliant experiences. And again, I can testify to that. The level of experience you get is just really, really um, brilliant and the insights you get as well and I learned a lot from the assistants that were there and covering different issues so I can definitely recommend that for anyone who has the opportunity and then I after finishing my law degree I went on and um, I did a master's in EU international relations in the College of Europe and again I think um, I think this is a really good experience to build a network and I, I don't like to say building a network or networking with people but I think maybe something like a support bubble is more used these days in COVID times, but uh, the commissioner was mentioning how maybe starting out in your career can be quite lonely. Um, I definitely know that now speaking from Kuala Lumpur, I haven't been home in seven months. I spent Christmas here. It's, uh, it's been a very strange posting, but a, a brilliant one all the same. But um, having that support bubble with, uh, so the College of Europe, there's people from every single member state. They all come at it with different experiences, different um, policy areas. And it's essentially like a forced family because you have to study together, eat together, live together. But you bring away those connections with you afterwards. And when you move to Brussels, if you're lucky enough to get a job, you can kind of use that. And I think uh, they also push you as well to learn new things because uh, other your young Europeans are extremely interested in everything. They're complete linguists. They're absolutely fantastic when it comes to languages. I came to the EU very proud of my kind of level of French from uh, my law and French degree and soon realized that uh, having one language is really not uh, something to be too proud of. Most of my friends have three, four languages that they can speak very well. So, you know, um, just learning to kind of push yourself around these people because they're very inspirational in their own ways. And now, so I, I worked for the Irish permanent representation in the Brexit unit. Um, it was a brilliant experience because it kind of shows you that there's only so much you can learn in university. I, I studied law, but Brexit didn't exist when I was studying law. So how do you prepare for a topic that doesn't exist when you're when you're studying? And I think the most important thing is to take away some of those skills with you. I think my law professors will kill me, kill me now, but I, I mean, I don't use too much of my law knowledge on a daily basis. But what I do use is the fact that, I mean, I'm very comfortable going through large um, large articles or books and kind of synthesizing down the information that I need and analyzing and they're the skills that I use. And I think that's what was important maybe in the Brexit unit. And it's also very helpful here in Malaysia. I work in the political section. I'm the only native English speaker in the delegation. And I, I hate to say this, but um, sometimes it has its benefits. I'm really aware of it because I don't like to think that because I am comfortable speaking English that maybe I have an advantage over someone else. Sometimes I think it's a disadvantage because you come at things in a certain way. You might, you know, speak because you're comfortable, but not really know what you're saying. Or So I think caution is advised there and everyone should make an effort to learn a different language as well, even if you're just speaking at a very basic level, just to show that, you know, you're engaged, that you're interested, that you have an open mind and you're willing to kind of push yourself as well. And I think the key advice I give here is you don't need a French degree to speak French. You know, don't always think that we need this formalized education. You don't. Um, most of the people I know, they didn't learn 
English through an English degree. They learned it through watching uh, scrubs on TV or how I met your mother or friends, you know, and there's a lot of ways you can learn a language without kind of fork. I know Karen was mentioning as well the, you know, forking out lots of money for, fun, uh, for doing a master's or a degree. And we need to be cognizant of the fact at the moment that a lot of young people are struggling. So I think take your education into your own hands as well and be curious about different things. And, you know, you can learn outside of the constructs of university. It's obviously brilliant to have that degree behind you, but um, don't feel like you can't kind of push yourself a bit further and um, take that into your own hands as well. And so, I mean, I'm really enjoying my experience here in Malaysia. I, I, I said I worked in the political section and um, I focus a lot on Erasmus, the Erasmus program here. We fund a lot of young Malaysians to study in Europe and I have to go around to the universities. I speak to them and I speak to their professors. So it's a lot of communication skills. It's a lot of listening and understanding. And it was brilliant before the pandemic because I got to speak to a lot of people. Obviously now it's changing quite a bit, but we're recalibrating how we work and we're still trying to reach out to a lot of Malaysians and kind of work on the EU strategies here, whether it's human rights or it's women's rights. And it's, I mean, I can just recommend and recommend because it's a, it's a fantastic career path and it's, it's something different every day. So I'm really enjoying it so far. Thank you very much for that, Ellen. And um, I think certainly what does shine through is how much you enjoy your job. And I think that is something that has come through um, for all three of our speakers here today. We, we have a couple of questions that have come in. I might just bunch them together a little bit and I will start, if that's all right, with Mairead then, because I know that she's under considerable time pressure. Uh, commissioner's work is never done. So, uh, one anonymous question is, what advice would you give recent undergraduates who want to pursue a career in the EU institutions? Should they pursue further study, look for an internship or what? I think actually Ellen is probably a very good role model in this regard. Um, but if, if, if you have any additional suggestions, that would be great. And a question from Miriam Dreesen Riley asking for those determined few who already made it through the process. What advice um, would Mairead or Karen have for mid-level officials who are interested in a senior management role? And a person also wants specifically, and we'll come to that, to ask Karen whether it's necessary to be a qualified solicitor or barrister to work in the legal service, or is a law degree enough? So uh, Mairead, I'll hand over to you. And if you want to comment on anything that any of the other speakers, uh, or indeed that I have said, then please feel free, the, the mic is yours. Well, thank you very much. And I've learned so much listening to both Karen and Ellen. And I think Ellen's wisdom is the one that everyone should listen to because you're living it. Um, so I, what really struck me, Ellen, was what you said, that you don't need uh, to have a master's or the degree, but it's important to have a foundation, but that, you know, you can teach yourself or continue to, to look for opportunities and languages is key. For example, I'm teaching myself French. Uh, because I, 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 I know, Ellen, as you put it, we really in Ireland have a problem with languages and we need to fix that. And I know there are efforts underway in terms of what to do, where to start. Um, I suppose you have to see what's available to you. What, what's the first possibility? And if, it, if your first choice, if you like, or way of going through, whether it's an internship or whatever, isn't there just now, maybe because of circumstances, is there a course you could do so that you have that under your belt for when things will change again? And my advice, um, because, you know, when I started out and I was 21 when I graduated, I had remembered a few years earlier writing to RTE about looking for a job, a bit like Karen's, except mine was more childish writing, I think. But it's funny how that actually came to pass. So it's no harm to reach out to um, both Irish MEPs, for example, but also MEPs from other member states if you have a CV and you're looking to for some experience. Um, I have rarely turned down requests for experience in my office when I was in the parliament. Sometimes it was a month, sometimes it was a little you know, longer, uh, but it was always helpful. So I think just look at the circumstances now, see what's possible. Um, what I'd love maybe Ellen might talk about, and I will have to leave unfortunately, um, this great conversation is how do you deal with the personal side? Like when it is lonely or when things don't go well, for you um, because I think the worst thing we can all do is pretend that it's always easy I think it's much better that people know actually sometimes it's you have a bad day we all have them on the issue of uh, those mid tracking so people who are there now and how to uh, progress 
Um, I think that there are opportunities um, for, for Irish people because we have fewer of them than we need within the institutions. I think when it comes to, to women, there is an awareness. It has been gathering slowly that we do need to promote women into all sorts of areas within the institutions. And I think in this regard, and maybe again, Karen has better direct knowledge, is to see where your area of interest is. And it was interesting, Karen, you had a focus and you wanted and it, it worked. Um, sometimes that's a good approach. So you can see that there will be an opportunity coming. Sometimes you might have to take the scenic route, do something else in order to arrive at where you actually want to be. And that can be a hard thing to do if you think I want to go straight there. But I don't think any of us on this uh, talk, maybe Maeve, I don't know, you haven't shared just the, the secrets yet, but I don't think any of us on this talk would have gone a direct way for anything. It just, that's not how life is. Um, but I suppose before I just leave this really important event to say um, that we need more young Irish men and women uh, within the institutions. Um, but also there's other places outside of the institutions, um, organizations, agencies, NGOs that do want to recruit um, young people. So there's also that opportunity. Um, but I, again, to go back to compliment um, our permanent representat representation here in Brussels who do so much work and Maeve in particular for pulling this together. Thank you for your videos because they're really, really excellent. Thank you, Karen. We see each other occasionally, but not physically very often. And Ellen, it's been a real pleasure to meet you, even if it is only virtually, and to hear of your enormous experience. Um, and the work that you're doing is very important because while we sometimes, you know, wor worry about what's happening within the European Union, in fact, it is the rest of the world where we also need to engage. And our, if you like, recent strategy about, you know, being stronger as a European Union is about being able to do more globally. So you're part of that movement, Ellen. Well done. And thank you all. Thanks again, Maeve. And with apologies that I'm leaving you now. And I'll say hello to Eamon as I say goodbye to everybody. Take care. Have a lovely day. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks very much, Commissioner, um, and um, the best of luck now with the rest of your day. And thank you for the support um, that you give us here as well in, in a great many of our activities, um, but this one in, in particular, which I can take very little credit for, by the way. There's a, a team of very hardworking people working on this remotely who deserve uh, far more credit for this than, than I do. But thank you and um, goodbye, and we hope we'll see you soon. Karen, I wonder if I could ask you um, just to speak to the question about the qualifications needed to work in the legal service, but also what advice you would give to mid-level officials who are interested in, uh, in a management role or to mid-career uh, people who are interested in perhaps switching to a job in, in the EU. Okay, well, uh, on the question of the qualifications needed to become a member of the legal service, no, there is no uh, requirement for a professional qualification. You don't have to be a solicitor or a barrister or uh, have any other national title. You do need to be a lawyer. So you need to have at least one law degree. And these days I managed to get in on a knowledge of national law. I think I was the last generation that could do that. These days, you certainly would need to have a very good grounding in EU law. But I mean, people have come to us just from an academic background. Sometimes people um, have done their primary degree, have spent some time doing a master's or a PhD and teaching, and then they come to us from there. So you just need to be usable. And that means you need to know EU law. So that's, that's all that's required. On well, the question about uh, people who would like to become um, senior managers, um, I think the first thing I would say, but this is my perspective, other people might have a different perspective on it. I would never have gone for a job that didn't really interest me. I, I have always thought that you will not do well a job that you don't really like and that is dealing with an area that you aren't very inspired by. So I think it's important to be careful and not to apply just all over the place. Focus your energies on something that you think you genuinely are interested in and could do well. Um, and then, of course, uh, there's the question of what you need to project in order to get selected. I think people skills uh, are incredibly important, more important than what you know. 
uh, and an interest in the big picture items. I mean, uh, when the commission is choosing people at director level, they're definitely looking for people who can take the helicopter view, who are interested in general policy, who are interested in the impact of whatever policy you might be dealing with on other people's work, on the things that are going on, on other legislative proposals or whatever the case might be. So you certainly need to be the kind of person who can lift your head up from what you're focusing on today and think about uh, wider implications. Um, and I think those are the two main things to, to, to make sure you're focusing on broad issues as well as the detail of your daily work and make sure that you are genuinely interested, because not everybody is genuinely interested in managing other people, because there are different kinds of people and we need both those who are, you know, what I call vedettes, you know, the stars, the ones who are great performers in their own right, but who are not necessarily made for or willing to put themselves into the background and just facilitate the work of other people. And if you're that kind of person, then it's foolish to be looking for a management job. And I think people need to examine themselves a bit more honestly than we sometimes do. We're led by the structures, especially of the Commission, but I think other institutions as well, to presume that moving forward must mean moving into a management role. And I just think it isn't for everybody. So I think that's an important question to ask yourself. Karen, thank you very much. And um, I think those are they, those are very useful insights. And they're actually also insights that we don't hear very often that I mean you should ask yourself if you're interested in managing other people before you before you apply for a management position. And I think it is excellent advice that you should, of course, be interested in in the substance of the job while also maintaining an interest in the bigger picture. Um, I'm going to go back to Ellen now because I think. Um, Mairead raised a very interesting point, as, as did you yourself, Ellen, around that word that we've all heard so much about in this past uh, year, resilience. I, I, I imagine that whenever COVID is over, there will be um, there will be an entire vocabulary that we will not want to hear again. But the word resilience is one we're hearing a lot about. It means a lot of different things. But I think in our career uh, that brings us abroad, um, what it means is, is an ability to handle the bad days um, and to enjoy the, the good days. And I, I'd like to hear, Ellen, your perspective on that, you know, on, on, on what helps you along uh, when, when you can't get home for Christmas, when you're on your first um, long distance posting, um, or when you encounter real cultural difference, um, which may go beyond simply a, a linguistic misunderstanding, but a genuinely different way of, of seeing the world from, from another person or another group of people. Anyway, Ellen, you talk to us because you're, you're there at, uh, at the cold face. Thank you, Ambassador. I think it's a, it's a tough question, but um, I mean, I would always say to kind of young people now, and I I mean, I'm only two or three years ahead myself, but just to be cognizant of the fact that we are dealing with kind of increased pressures all of the time, we're expected to maybe know a lot more about a lot of things, but also work in a very complicated world and a very competitive world, I think, as well. Now there are 27 EU member states and you're essentially maybe competing with a lot of those very bright people to get um, positions. And I saw someone in the chat box asked about um, imposter syndrome as well and how it's like to work with uh, these people and I think it's a very good question and I think it's important to take a step back and to try and be confident about what you know yourself about what knowledge you can bring and if you haven't thought, thought about that you know you need to you need to think about that you need to know what value you can bring but I also think it's important I mean I always say like you know push yourself and learn new things but there has to be a limit to that and there has to be um, you have to be aware as well that we're not, no one is a super person, particularly a young professional. I think we can't, there'll never be a day where we're saving the world or we're fixing the problems of the commission, you know, we come in at a lower level and you need to be aware that we're still learning and we have a lot to learn. So I think two main things you can do and one is to reach to people above you. I think, um, you know, you might be a bit intimidated when you come in at the start, but all of your colleagues at higher levels have dealt with these same pressures, these same issues. So reaching out to them and maybe a more informal way and asking their advice on how they transitioned at the start, I think it's very important. But secondly, and maybe even more important, is to build 
a friend group around you and people who understand what you're going through because you know there are different conditions now in terms of salary in terms of living in brussels or abroad and all these things can take an impact on young people so i think it's important to have other people that understand you and you know you can do that in very simple ways um i mean here this is a bit silly but uh badminton is the national sport of malaysia i'm terrible at badminton but i started playing just to you know just to meet people and pick up something new and you know take it easy and um i'm still terrible at badminton but it's been a way to kind of de-stress and um i think things like that are important that we're not always pushing ourselves too hard thank you ellen and um i think that's very wise advice as well speaking as someone who's also terrible at uh, at badminton but I, I have to say one of the best pieces of advice i ever got starting out my own career was to maintain interests beyond your job uh, and and friends beyond your job as well um because it, it will keep you grounded and keep you sane and uh, on on the on the bad days it'll it'll get you through and uh, no one no one will give you honest feedback like someone who who knows you all your life uh, as well as so uh, no thank you for that now we've uh, a question here from anonymous saying i've gone back to college as a mature student i'm age 46 would it be harder to start a new career in europe at my age in competition with younger graduates. So I, I can say to Anonymous that from the point of view of the Irish Civil Service, no, um, certainly we're always very happy to see mature entrants um, to the Department of Foreign Affairs and uh, they bring very, very valuable experience with them. But I might just hand that question over to Karen as well, just to see if she has a perspective on it um, from the European Commission end. Okay, well, I think, um it's not that you couldn't come, uh, and it might indeed be that you have very valuable experience which would be uh, useful uh, inside uh, an institution. But there might be a, a hesitation, a doubt, um, in terms of recruiting somebody older as to how content you would be in the long run, because you'd be coming in at a, probably a very basic grade. And in time, our experience is that people think they're going to be happy and content with that. But over time, they become discontent because they realize that they're a lot older than the people who are in the same grade as them. Uh, and it does make for difficulties in terms of career progression. So uh, I don't think, as far as I remember, we abolished the bar because there used to be a maximum age that we could recruit people at. As far as I remember, that has been abolished. But uh, there is just this uh, lingering doubt. Uh, we, do, we do sometimes recruit people uh, who are a, a good deal older than the other people in their grade if, if they do a very good interview and they really impress us. But a question we always ask is, you know, have you thought about this yourself and are you going to remain content? And that's something you need to think about. OK, thank you, Karen. That's a very honest answer. Um, um, and I hope that it is not a huge barrier, though, to participation, because I know we certainly have benefited very much from having experienced and senior entrants uh, coming in. Now, we have another um, few questions here. Again, another one for Karen, are there roles in the legal service for young people who may not be quite experienced enough for a lawyer or lawyer linguist role? And one from Angela Feeney asking, is the stage process the best way to access future jobs in the EU? And will Brexit create uh, job opportunities, presumably for Irish people? Um, uh, rules in the legal service for young inexperienced lawyers not really uh, i have to tell the truth we have talked from time to time about having paralegals um i don't remember whether one team or the other has has had one at some stage but no by and large we are looking for uh lawyers who will be able to take on it's it's a fairly um demanding job you have to be able to um, impose yourself, so to speak, on the client department, which may or may not be happy to listen to your advice if it's going to make difficulties for them doing what they want to do. Uh, you have to be the kind of person who's going to be able to do court cases. So going to the court of justice and standing up and being the one standing in front of the judges being grilled and answering questions. So, you know, we need people who are 
at that now I was only 25 when I started so you know it depends what you mean by no experience um, but you certainly have to be the kind of person who is ready to take on a good deal of responsibility and and grow into quite a demanding role uh, so the only profiles we have are uh, lawyers in the substance teams as we call them and uh, the lawyer linguists um, is a stage a good way of getting in? Uh, yes, I think so. I think the stage is a, a great way of um, having a sort of a taster and seeing whether you actually like uh, the way uh, the institution or a particular DG uh, works. Um, and it's also an opportunity if you don't have language skills if you to work on them, you know, because you, you have the opportunity of living in Brussels for five or six months. And uh, I think someone who is thinking about a future career, the thing they really need to be thinking about if they don't have good French or German uh, is to uh, work on that. And will Brexit bring more opportunities? Well, it's hard to say, but certainly I think English speakers are going to be in very great demand. Yes, I mean, I, uh, there's nothing official that says that, but it just seems to me to stand to reason. Uh, we are in desperate need of English speakers throughout the house. Thank you, Karen. I'm just going to ask Ellen to say one or two things about roles for young people in um, in the EU generally, because you're a junior professional in delegation, Ellen. And um, I worked in an EU delegation myself some years back at around the time that this um, scheme uh, came into development it was just after the EEAS uh, was set up and I think it has it has both benefited I hope many young people but it has certainly benefited the work of a great many of uh, the European Union's delegations outside the EU I should add that there are, the EU delegations are a bit like embassies in other countries outside of the European Union so do you want to tell us a little bit about that Ellen and then I think um, we're going to have to bring this to a close because then and nearly an hour has flown by and I'll be handing over to my colleague Eamon after that. But anyway, Ellen, fire ahead there. Thanks, Ambassador. I, I think it's, um, you know, there are a lot of junior professionals in delegation. We have to go through a competitive process and it's chosen by the member states. A lot of those JPDs have done a blue book stage in the commission or in Brussels before they were chosen for that role, because again, it is quite competitive. So maybe to set yourself aside, it's good to show that you already have some experience within the institutions. Um, so it's not unusual to do a stage in Brussels than to do something like the JPD or else. Um, I think the stage is a brilliant opportunity then to go on and do the cast, which is the kind of temporary roles that you can take up in the commission. You also need to maybe think about which inst institution you're interested in because the commissioner also brought up the opportunities that are in the European Parliament. So it's also a fantastic opportunity if you want to be an assistant. And there, there are many, many, I mean, roles in the kind of institutions that are lesser known, like even the Council of Europe the, or the European Council. You know, there's, there, there are opportunities there that are not, because the blue book stage is very sought after, it's a very competitive process and you need a you need quite good language standards going in at the moment. I think you need like a B2 in your second language. That can be Irish. So we do have a, an advantage there. I think it can be Irish anyway, you'll have to check that. But um, so there are opportunities. You just need to keep on pushing, you know, you'll find something eventually. Um, but I can highly recommend the JPD process as well. I think it's a brilliant opportunity to get experience abroad. And I think a lot of employers are looking for that now, you know, have you not only lived abroad, but maybe in a country that is not very easy to live in or that is culturally very different? And how do you show then that you adapt to that kind of new experience? Thank you, Ellen. Um, now we have a few more questions, but I think I might ask um, when I hand over to my colleague Eamon Mackay to say a little bit more about the kind of support that we offer to Irish citizens already in Brussels in particular to access careers in the EU institutions. But first, I'd like to thank um, each of our guests for taking the time to reflect on your careers with us. It's been a real privilege just to hear what you've had to say. And I'd like to thank those watching for their great questions. And I hope that wherever you are watching, you found the event valuable. 
As we know, the EU is made up of 27 member states, so there's a guiding rate as to the percentage of jobs that can be held by any one nationality, and it's based on population size. So in Ireland's case, that's about 1.6% of EU jobs. And at the moment, we are a little over that. However, as I think both Karen and uh, Commissioner McGuinness have alluded to, many of the Irish in the EU are approaching retirement age. So in a few years' time, Ireland may well be underrepresented. Um, another key figure, given the day that's in it, that I'd like everyone to think about is that Irish men outnumber Irish women in senior management posts in the Commission by about two to one. Uh, and that isn't a reflection, an accurate reflection of, of the, the abilities of Irish men and Irish women. So there's every reason for us to think that some very interesting European job opportunities are going to be open to Irish women and Irish men in the coming 10 years. Now, look, these are difficult times and sad times for many of us, um, including, as I think has been mentioned a number of times, for younger people whose education has been so disrupted. But I think St. Bridget's Day has always been a time to remember that winter passes and brighter days are coming. And I hope this event on careers, on managing your future and on looking at possibilities, um, even when there are setbacks and zigs and zags in the road, I, I hope that's a reminder that we can take home with us that the future is not cancelled because of COVID. And I'd like to say that to, in particular to all of the young people who are listening uh, to this today, that, uh, you know, there, there are still many opportunities uh, ahead. And I hope that many of you will think about finding opportunities within the EU because, because we need your contribution and your voice here. So on that thought, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Eamon McGay, who heads up the institutions team at the Perm Rep. Um, he and his team have organised this event, and I'd like to thank them very much for their support to me uh, today in getting ready for it. And I'm going to ask Eamon now to say a bit more about the EU jobs process. So thank you all. It's, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks, Maeve, and uh, thank you in particular for your own uh, moderating uh, and hosting skills today, which uh, added so much to the event. Um, as the, the, the director of our, our parliament and institutions team, effectively, I suppose it falls to me to lead in the rep on EU jobs. And what has struck me more and more about that over the recent past is that it is very much a collaborative issue. So it's one that the senior management in our own department, but also across the public service and beyond need to take cognizance of. And I think it's wonderful to have the buy-in uh, of senior colleagues such as yourself on this very important piece of activity that the rep is involved in together with departments, particularly the Department of the Taoiseach and our own department in Dublin in terms of trying to promote EU jobs more generally. Um, I echo your thanks to the other speakers as well. It's wonderful to have the commissioner take a direct interest in this area. And Karen, um, you know, I think your distinguished career is a real inspiration to younger Irish law graduates and students. And I hope hearing from you today will have encouraged them to follow in your, in your footsteps. It's also good to hear uh, from those who joined the institutions uh, even more recently uh, in terms of what Ellen had to say. And I thought some very interesting threads to the entire three contributions, which uh, for us certainly uh, would, would, I think, underline the validity of having decided to do this today and to give it a very particular St. Bridget's Day focus. Um, I should also thank my own uh, team, Dara and Aphrodite, who have been brilliant in putting all this together today. So that's the first thing I want to do is say a couple of thanks. And the second thing I might just do is say a little bit of, uh, of maybe of words in mop up on the Q&A. Um, two issues. One is the question of, of trainees and very specifically the Commission's Blue Book, book trainee scheme. Uh, the next application period for that ends uh, in uh, August 21 or comes up in August 21. 21, the Parliament's Schumann traineeship scheme. Uh, the next application period, period there is in June 2021, and the Council's traineeship scheme, the next application period there opens on the 15th of this month. Um, so there is, uh, you know, a, a raft of opportunities coming uh, down, the, down the track at us on this. Important to say, and it echoes one of the questions earlier on, there is no formal age limit to particip participate in the traineeship programmes. 
And there's also the caste system, which has been referred to, which is very important in terms of uh, getting into contract roles in the institutions. It's another way to look at things and uh, maybe to be exploring. Um, Maeve mentioned the question of supports from uh, our, our own office. And on that, just to say that we do offer very active supports in the form of advice. Uh, we have a, a training manual for the computer-based tests of the competitions. Uh, we do workshops uh, now, obviously, online. And we even do one-to-one -one coaching sessions for the later stages of competitions. So please don't hesitate to contact us at eujobs at dfa.ie. The third thing I just want to mention is our overall EU job strategy. Now there, both the Commissioner and Karen have been very clear about why you need such a strategy uh, and what it gives to Ireland effectively. Um, we are facing a bit of a demographic cliff, so that's why the current programme for government has committed to the development of a new EU job strategy. And I think some of the people on this call will have actually responded to the consultation uh, that went ahead of that strategy. We expect to see the strategy published in the next few months. Um, I don't want to oversell it, but I do think this would be an important piece of work. Um, it would bring together a lot of what we're already doing on EU jobs, but it will also, I think, add potentially significant pieces uh, to, to our arsenal uh, in terms of EU jobs. Um, this is a medium term activity. So sometimes it can be difficult at the political level to, to engage and own something like that. And I'm very grateful to Minister Byrne, who has really put his shoulder behind this EU job strategy, and we look forward to seeing the final product. Finally, um, can I just say that um, we seriously encourage anyone thinking of applying for EU jobs in the future to go ahead and do that, to, to apply. We are willing uh, and able to support you, and we'll do so as much as we can. The last thing I wanted to do today was to mention that uh, we are launching just now the first in a series of five videos that were specially commissioned for St. Bridget's Day. They are effectively portraits of five Irish women working in the European Union institutions. And we're going to launch the first of those now, which features uh, the EU Ombudsman, Emily O'Reilly. So I thank you again for joining and uh, enjoy, uh, please enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks very much again, bye-bye. Europe, the EU, Brussels can be incredibly obscure. My name is Emily O'Reilly. I'm currently the European Ombudsman. I'm originally from Tullamore in County Offaly, though I spent most of my life in Dublin. Uh, my role is to be the watchdog of the European administration. So anybody who feels they haven't been treated well by any of the institutions, agencies, bodies of the European Union can come and put a complaint before me and I'll do my best to resolve it. I was really interested in politics. I mean, I remember watching US presidential elections when I was eight, writing about them, everything. And I think the sort of sensibility that I had around my curiosity about, you know, well, current affairs generally, how governments work, how things happen, uh, how, how people operate in, in the political landscape and so on, that had been a fascination of mine since I was really young. And, and in a way, um, obviously my, my job as a journalist uh, obviously encompass that, but also my, my role as an ombudsman encompass that. I mean, at the moment, we're about to launch a big investigation into how the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control operated during the pandemic, particularly during the early weeks and months. And I mean, you could look at that as a piece of investment journalism as well. I mean, obviously there are differences. We're looking at it through a different prism. As an Irish woman, and as an Irish woman of my, of my generation, uh, our entry into the EU liberated us. It enabled me and others to have the public life outside of the home uh, that, that, that we've had. And, and it wasn't our own government that did that. In fact, our own government fought to nail not to have certain labour laws that discriminated against women um, removed from the statute book under pressure from the EU. Uh, so I, that, that, that has always made me a big fan um, of, of, of this project because I saw what it did uh, for Irish women and, and, and for others. The occasion was the anniversary of the Treaty of Rome, which created the EU effectively, and there was a wonderful celebration in Rome, actually in the building that uh, that the treaty was signed. And Mairead McGuinness is there now, the Commissioner, and the other women are MEPs uh, from 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 different countries. And so it was it was it was a wonderful occasion, and it was just a celebration of something positive. <laughs>